Hi, in this video I thought we'd have a look at this Omega pulse oximeter. Uh, this is one of the early pulse oximeters that was available on the market. This one uh, was designed in 1988. I'm not quite sure uh, when this particular device was made. Uh, but I bought this around three years ago for a teardown and never actually got round to doing it because um, it didn't come with the, uh, with the little finger probe. Uh, I ended up ordering this from China and it ended up taking about two or three months to get here. Uh, and then by then I didn't have time to do the teardown. Um, so what this is, is a pulse oximeter which is used for measuring the saturated O2 levels in the blood. And what it has is a couple of LEDs. So it's got a red LED and an infrared LED in one package on one side. And then on the other side, we've just got a, uh, a photodiode. And what it does is you put your finger in here and it measures the, um, it measures the absorbance um, of the infrared and the red light. And the ratio between those two gives an indication of how well saturated the blood is. Uh, it also has the pulse rate on here. Uh, mine's a little bit high at the moment because I've uh, just had a coffee. Um, but before we tear it apart, I thought what we'd do is um, I would try and hold my breath for as long as I can and see what happens when the uh, saturated O2 level goes down. So, um, okay, I'm gonna hold my breath from now. Right, so there we go, that was about three minutes. Um, you can see the saturated O2 has gone down quite a lot and the heart rate has gone up quite a lot as a result. I guess that's an alarm response, but that should uh, recover relatively quickly. Um, but yeah, it's, um, it seems to do its job. You can see how it's useful if someone was starting to run out of oxygen, it would give an alarm at the preset level. And there's a couple of uh, buttons here which you can use to set that level. It's currently set to 90 and I think that's the default level. Normally it should sit about... Um, 95 to uh, 100 somewhere around there and you can also set some alarms for the uh, the pulse rate range um, you've got a couple of buttons here for the graphing lcd so you've sort of got the status of the sao2 and the pulse rate on this side and then on here we've got the graphing of the um at the moment it's it's plotting the um the waveform it's detecting for the heart rate and then there's another button here which you can use uh, to look at the trends. So this is sort of the saturated um, O2 level. Um, you can see here, that's, that's the attempt that I just did. Um, and then you've got one that does the same thing over the last 60 minutes. And then you've got a couple of buttons here for setting the pulse volume and the alarm. So um, you can have it beeping every time it detects a heartbeat. And similarly, there was an alarm that was going off just then. You can have that much louder if you want to. Right, so what we've got with the cover off is the mains coming in here straight into a iron core transformer. And this is what's providing the main bit of isolation between the patient and the mains inlet. So this needs to have an isolation rating uh, between primary and secondary of at least 2.5 kV. Um, and then it goes straight into the PCB here. And this board is dedicated to sort of the power supply and power management. So the AC from the uh, secondary of the transformer goes straight into this bridge rectifier into these two big capacitors um, and then that's sort of the unregulated supply to the board. Um, we've got our lead acid battery at the back here so this has got four cells um, and that's charged by this LM317 that's sort of tied to this back panel uh, that comes onto this connector here and that just float charges this lead acid battery so it's not doing any sort of smart charging uh, and then what we've got here is a pair of relays, one for uh, connecting the battery in and out and one for turning the uh, the power to the device on and off So when we saw the front panel, there wasn't actually any hard power switch So this has a, uh, a soft power switch on the membrane and all of this electronics here is associated with turning that toggle button um, into uh, a means of keeping the device turned on until you press it again So, you know an impressive number of ICs here just to, purport to uh, perform that very simple feature. Um, then we've got some power supplies here. So uh, we've got a inverter here for the electroluminescent backlights that are on both of the LCDs. Um, so that will produce somewhere between 100 and 150 volts usually. Uh, and then we've got some linear supply rails. So we've got our main five volt supply and then our uh, analog five volt supply. And then we've got minus 15, plus 15, and minus 5 volts, and these are all switching regulators. 
Uh, they're Texas Instruments TL497s, and the amusing thing about these is uh, the headline in the data sheet is that the efficiency is as high as 60%, uh, which obviously is, is really low by today's standards, but these use much lower switching frequencies than we're used to today. Um, you know, sort of in the between 20 and 60 kilohertz, depending on how you configured them. Uh, modern switches that get uh, well over 90% are up near 1 megahertz. Um, so these have got much bigger inductors and consequently there are a few more losses in the, uh, the switching circuitry. And then we've just got a little bit of electronics here for providing a, uh, a reference voltage for the analog. Uh, and then a bit here for monitoring the state of charge of the lead acid and and it sort of gives an indication um, for the front panel if the battery is getting close to being flat. There are a couple of tantalums on the board. Um, I didn't even think they would be on here actually, but uh, there's quite a few tantalums here um, and the blue one here. Um, so surprisingly, they didn't all go pop when I turned it on. I'm you know, quite surprised that it didn't do that. And also, interestingly, the uh, electrolytics are all uh, completely fine. No sign of bulging. Um, no electrolyte leakage or anything. So uh, these are Elmer branded capacitors and obviously they were very high quality because you know even 20 years down the line they're still uh, performing fine. Right so this next board down in the board stack is basically a, uh, a microcontroller. So this is the logic board but microcontrollers weren't really a thing um, in this vintage equipment. So this is a Z80 CPU. Uh, and then you've got your RAM chips, your ROM chips, so uh, 1988, uh, these were programmed. Uh, you've got a big 40-pin DIP package here for the UART, uh, so that provides a serial app on the back panel. Uh, you've got various bits of logic just tying everything together all around the outside. Uh, and then you've got a D to, D to A converter because there are two analog outputs on the back panel. Uh, which are providing sort of analog replicates of um, the data that's plotted on the LCD, so the SPO2 reading and the pulse reading. And yeah, none of these boards have got components on the underside. Um, they've just got all of the traces, and you can see the uh, the solder mask is starting to bubble away, which is seems to be really common for this kind of vintage uh, PCB. But uh, yeah, I actually um, I actually met the guy that designed uh, some of these boards at a recent. Uh, client meeting. He used to work for uh, Omeda, which then became Datex Omeda, but I, um, I spoke to him about this and uh, yeah, he said he was involved in the development. There was a team of uh, quite a few engineers working on this design um, and a whole load of drafts people doing the PCB layout. This one's actually a four layer. You can see um, some uh, traces on the inner layers and then, and then some further ones on the outer board, but uh, yeah, relatively advanced for its age. And then we've got a, um, a metal separator between these boards and the analog board, which is actually uh, just Moonders. Right, so this is the analog board, and interestingly it had this uh, little board which is described as the interface board plugged in here, but it has exactly the same header on it, so I don't know if this is basically a bodge board, uh, but it is described in the service manual. I actually uh, forgot all about the service manual while I've been doing this teardown. Um, but we'll have a look at the schematic for the analog board in a minute because it is quite interesting. Um, the service manual describes the, the main ADC as a 10-bit ADC, but from looking at the specs of the 574A, uh, every source I can find says this is a 12-bit ADC, so I don't know if this has been retrofitted because the 10-bit the part got obsoleted or something. Um, but actually, there's not that much analog stuff on here. Uh, we've obviously got some analog electronics around here and then we've got a couple of op amps here but a lot of it is um, switching because, um, let me grab the schematic. So the schematic's a little bit hard to read but basically what we've got is we've got an infrared LED and a red LED and a photodiode and what it does is it pulses the red LED, uh, turns it off, pulses the infrared LED and then turns it off uh, and what it's doing with the photo detector is it reads a sample when the red LED's on read a sample when the infrared LED is on, and then reads an ambient light reading. And then all of the multiplexing and demultiplexing is done by the hardware on this board. So uh, there is a little EEPROM, but actually this isn't storing program data or anything like that. It's actually just storing um, sort of the, the codes required to activate the ADC and sequence those LEDs flashing on and off, uh, because the, the CPU is 
too too busy uh, trying to drive the LCDs and everything like that. So they're they're offloading as much of the um, analog sampling and sequencing to this board on its own, and then you just sort of get a clock input from the processor board, and it gives the uh, the demultiplexed analog reading uh, well analog to digital readings out back on the port for it just to read along with an indication of uh, which sample it's talking about. So um, there's a couple of bits of uh, electronics along here. So we've got our reference voltage being buffered here, which uh, is being used uh, mainly by the, the ADC and some of that circuitry. Uh, we've got our analog multiplexers here for switching in and out the LEDs uh, and switching in and out the photodiodes into uh, some sample and holds. Uh, but our signal comes in through the, uh, the probe section here through this buffer uh, and then it goes through a uh, photo detector preamp here so this is um, where we do our main amplification because the signal from the photodiode is is very small uh, we want that to meet our, dyna our highest dynamic range for the ADC and then it basically goes into our DC separator and our DC stripper so these are trying to get rid of the ambient light and also any um, sort of uh, DC bias voltage that, that are floating around in the electronics and then we've got a bit of sequencing here along with some filters and basically this is what's sampling and holding the um, the analog voltages that have been recorded from the photodiode after they've been amplified and then basically this all goes off into the A to D uh, and then out onto the um, onto the bus back onto the processor board uh, but yeah I mean there's a lot of logic on here which would be integrated into a, a modern chip these days. Uh, obviously you'd still need your decent A to D and some op amps uh, to do the multiplexing and demultiplexing. We've obviously got some uh, very nice film capacitors here in the white packages. Um, ceramics weren't really a thing um, back then in terms of larger values plus they're quite micro microphonic so um, they tend to give um, you know, erroneous readings if they're used in amplifier circuits if the device is likely to get tapped or knocked or something like that. So these are all expensive film capacitors, uh, all of these large blocky ones, quite small in value really. Uh, and then the rest here is, is all logic. A couple of tantalums, um, again these are all in good condition. Uh, they certainly didn't explode when I turned it on which is quite a common thing to happen. No bodge wires on the back so the only bodge so far really potentially is this uh, this little interface board uh, which just has a, an op amp and a little bit more logic on here um, and that's it really. Right so on our front panel we've got our graphic LCD on the left here and the character LCD on the right um, we've just got a, uh, a couple of ICM7232 LCD controllers uh, for driving the character LCD so this is just a bare glass um, LCD so this does all of the, um, the driving for that uh, and then we've got a graphic LCD which actually has some uh, LCD drivers already on the board so you can see the little Hitachi logo on the chip there uh, and then it just goes off onto this interface board which connects um, this to the, the board and back to the digital board but um, the graphic LCD is actually quite intensive on the CPU so that sort of describes or explains why the analog board sort of has as much functionality built into it as possible so that the processor doesn't have to deal with um, writing graphics to all of these and interfacing with the front panel buttons as well as trying to multiplex and demultiplex uh, the signals for the LEDs and the photodiodes. Um, but yeah, and then we've, we've just got the connector from the, um, from the sensor that just goes straight into that interface board. So yeah, I can't find any additional isolation um, other than the main transformer, which is kind of puzzling really because um, yeah, on the back panel, um, you've got your digital interface which is a serial port which you could connect to a PC um, to interface with it and um, you know if that PC has a fault you'd be injecting your um, your voltage straight into this connector here onto the logic board and then that's sharing digital buses and voltage supplies with the analog board which is connected directly to your um, finger probe and that whole thing could be floating up at some dangerous voltage uh, potentially uh, ready to harm the patient. So certainly in all of the designs that I've ever done for medical devices those any external interfaces that could be plugged into some piece of unknown equipment um, would have additional isolation of the same rating as um, your main power transformer or whatever you're using. 
just so that anything that you plug into it cannot harm the patient, no matter sort of what fault occurs. Um, there is a, an equipotential bond, so all of our grounds connect to this big binding post, um, and that includes the DC zero volts, and this binding post is what connects to everything either in the operating room or uh, at the bedside, so you have an equipotential bond that connects everything together uh, to try and reduce the risk of uh, floating chassis grounds and that kind of thing, but it doesn't protect the signal lines from being injected with a really high voltage and, and appearing at the patient terminal. So, um, yeah, that's a little bit puzzling. I'm, I'm surprised they've got away with that, really. I guess uh, maybe things weren't quite as well defined as they are in ISO 60601 um, in the, you know, the modern revisions. Um, this is from 1988, and maybe things have evolved since then. Um, just a couple of other things, really. We've got our um, potentiometer here for the contrast on the LCD. And actually, this is a, a really high quality potentiometer. You wouldn't see that used on a, a piece of equipment today. You know, th these are these are a couple of quid at least each. Uh, we've got our lead acid battery cells. So um, yeah, just four of those in, in sort of um, they're almost D-sized uh, shape cells. I've never seen lead acids in this kind of format before. Uh, but yeah, relatively low voltage. Uh, when I bought it, I was expecting maybe a little 12 volt battery to go in here, but uh, clearly not. And then we've just got a speaker here for making the tones. And the analog board actually has uh, some of the electronics for making those tones. I guess it's classed as analog, um, but it doesn't really do much. There's a couple of beep uh, types, and I guess they're, they're just generated on the board uh, and amplified straight onto this speaker. So I'd recommend that you have a read through the service manual. Um, it does have quite a lot of useful information about the analogue side of things and certainly if you haven't done much analogue design you may not know that much about uh, modulation and demodulation techniques for reducing noise and sources of interference. Um, it's certainly taught a lot less uh, these days because there's less uh, analogue radio which tended to be quite a, an early way of getting people involved in modulation and demodulation techniques. Uh, but it's very commonly used in optoelectronic systems in medical devices and in other devices. Um, and it sort of describes how you can get away from sources of noise, either 50, 60 hertz noise or from flicker noise and other noise sources that appear at very low frequencies. If you can move all of your sampling uh, up to a higher frequency, you get away from all of those sources of noise um, and you can get a much higher fidelity signal. So yeah, there's quite a lot here on how the LEDs are driven and the photodiodes, um, you know, how the ambient light is rejected, sorry, how the ambient light is rejected, um, sort of using switched capacitors to store um, the ambient light and then subtract it away from the signal when you do your sampling on your um, signal and reference channels. Uh, but yeah, certainly worth a read through this. Uh, I definitely recommend that you do that. So hopefully you found that teardown interesting. For me, I think it's just amazing how big things once were uh, and how much we can fit into uh, a small device these days. So you can get uh, pulse oximeters that are literally the size of the clip-on thing and it's got the battery and it's got the Bluetooth and everything all in it in something this big that you can just poke on your finger and uh, you, know, you haven't got any of this other stuff in there. Um, Whereas, you know, you've got a massive board here just for the power supply rails on something that really isn't using that much power. Um, yeah, it's just amazing that things have, have been miniaturized so much. Um, but yeah, I hope you found that useful. Uh, and until next time, thanks for watching.